Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming. My name is Mike Mulia. I'm a scientist here at the UNC Coastal Studies Institute. Particularly, I work in our ocean energy program studying the Gulf Stream off of North Carolina. And I'm a pretty informal guy, so as I mentioned before, um, <clears throat> if you guys have any questions as I'm going through my presentation, please don't stop to ask, and I may ask you some as we go along if I don't hear anything. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty informal, but I'm not this informal. Uh, I normally would do a little better than a raggedy old sweatshirt to give a presentation, but the truth is I just got off an offshore cruise four or five days um, out in the Gulf Stream and walked in the door here to give the presentation. So the good part uh, for you on all that is that uh, I d adapted the presentation. I was, I was traveling here from Moorhead City to include some pictures and videos of what we just did in the last couple of days to study the Gulf Stream. So I'll tell you a little bit about that towards the end. Um, here's what I'd like to talk about tonight. First of all, what is the Gulf Stream? Why do we have a Gulf Stream? Um, what's it doing off North Carolina, specific to us, right? And our ocean energy program is interested in finding out if it's a potential source of renewable energy for North Carolina. So as I talk about that, I want you to envision something on the scale of a wind turbine, but underwater in the Gulf Stream, spinning. Okay, that's, we're not there yet, but that's the kind of thing that we're thinking about. And then finally, how do we find out? How do we find out what kind of energy resource we have out there for North Carolina? And that's something that I, I do particularly. So I'll show you some of the methods that we use to determine what that energy resource is, where it is, and, and how it varies. So this is one of the earliest depictions of the Gulf Stream. And this is Benjamin Franklin's drawing. Have you guys seen this before? No. It's incredibly accurate. So this is the late 1700s. And some things to note here is that the volume transport of the Gulf Stream through the Florida Straits tends to be about a third of what it is off of Cape Hatteras, and then even more offshore here. And, and, and that's an incredible job of capturing that if you imagine what was available for information on the Gulf Stream back then. Um, do you guys know what the Gulf Stream is? Does anybody want to take a stab at that? Come on, you guys are from North Carolina. Somebody fishes out there. Somebody you knows something about the Gulf Stream. It's, it's uh, an underwater and a surface current. It's a warm water current. That's correct. So we're bringing, transporting a lot of heat up from the south to the north. Um, how about some of the speeds? Anybody have an idea how fast the current, how fast it's moving? Steven? Three meters per second? That's a really good guess. So yes, it tops out about three meters per second. How fast is that? That's like four to five knots, right? So if you jump overboard in a four to five knot current, you're going to have trouble swimming against it unless you're a superstar. What's on either end of the uh, depiction there? Where does it start? How Where does it, does it go? and how far up does it go? Well, that's a good question. So really there's no beginning or end, right? It depends on how you determine that because it's a cycle of water that moves up and around the, the Gulf of Mexico, comes up the Florida Straits, and then as it gets further offshore, it gets diffused and variated as it comes out. Yep. I have a question. Uh, my wife and I were on a sailboat coming out of uh, uh, Lisbon and sailing off the coast of Africa toward the Canary Islands. And the captain said, this was a large sailboat, about 180 feet long, said the Gulf Stream is really pushing this way. So was he correct? Off the Canary Islands? Off the Canary Islands, west of the Canary Islands. N no. He was wrong. <laughs> It really is a, so the Gulf Stream is a western boundary current, which will let me tell you a little bit about where, why it is, where it comes from. And what I'm showing is a, an, the annual average, these are called stream flows, of winds over the North Atlantic Basin. So we're right here, here's the coastline, and the winds are doing this over the year. And the effect of that is to torque the surface currents 
on the Atlantic Ocean. So what do I mean by that? I have this picture, this is a torque wrench. And essentially what we're doing is we're forcing the ocean currents to, to circulate like this. And there, it's a very kind of a complicated explanation for why everything works out the way it does, but that is what's forcing the circulation. Now, <coughs> this is what the ocean currents look like due to that forcing, right? So you are out here, and this is called a western boundary current. This is the Gulf Stream. It's an extremely intense current flowing from south to north, and any, any north American ocean basin will have a western boundary current. So off okay. of Japan, you have Kuroshio. We were sailing south. Uh, could you have been talking? I, I can't imagine somebody just lying straight face. So when he talked about the Gulf Stream, he was talking about the influence of the waves that we're coming straight into at this time two months ago. Well, he was. So, again, if you ask where the Gulf Stream starts and where it finishes, you well, see that it, I'm looking at Africa right now. it doesn't really, right? So it's part of this giant global circulation. So he may have been referring to the fact that this is the return yeah. flow here. And what's really unique about this is you can get in a boat from North Carolina and you, in a day you can drive offshore and cross the flow here and come back home and have dinner. Yes. And it would take you the rest of the week to drive across the rest of the basin. So in this little area right here, all this flow is coming to the north and then across the rest of the basin is where the return is. So it's a very, very intense flow. And so the Gulf Stream plays a major role in heat transport. And the North Atlantic is unique in that it's, it's a heat sink. It's one of the only two places in the global oceans other than Antarctica where there's subduction of water. So surface water is moving towards the bottom of the ocean and that surface water goes down and it stays down and travels along the eastern seaboard. And so all this heat is being taken down there and the Gulf Stream plays a key role in transporting that heat back to the north. And it plays such a key role to compare to the Pacific, you have a current like this called the Kuroshio, but you don't have a sink like that. And so that's why you're on the same latitude when you're in England as, say, Alaska, and the climate is much warmer because you're, you're bringing all this heat up. So what's it doing that's specific to North Carolina? That's what we're interested in tonight, right? So here's just some basic facts. And um, I'm going to use some oceanographic terms. And you'll find out that there are big fancy words that oceanographers like to use that are pretty simple concepts. And I don't know why we maybe we like to make ourselves feel good, but um, this is an amazing little statement here. As the Gulf Stream goes through the Florida Straits, it transports about 30 sphere drips of water, which is an oceanographic unit. And what that means is 30 million cubic meters of water per second are moving through the Florida Straits on average. By the time it gets up off of Cape Hatteras, it's 90 million cubic meters of water per second that's being transported off of Cape Hatteras. Now, I don't get my head around that, those kind of numbers. I don't know what that means, but to put it into perspective, all the rivers in the entire world flow two sphere drips, all of them. The Amazon River, which is the largest river in terms of water transport, is about a quarter of a sphere drip. So 90 sphere drips off of Cape Hatteras is an incredible amount of water moving and you can only imagine how much energy and heat is being transported with a warm current like that. Off of North Carolina the Gulf Stream lies between 24 and 75 kilometers offshore. For scientists like we, we like the metric system but that's like 15 to 45 miles depending on where you define offshore, right? It's much further offshore from Kitty Hawk than it is from Hatteras. Um, the maximum current speeds are about two meters per second. Stephen said about three meters per second and we have measured currents in excess of three meters per second so it does get that fast. Um, the Gulf Stream is about 75 kilometers wide, 45 miles, and the water temperature is about 25 degrees or 77 degrees Fahrenheit in the jet, in the main flow of the stream. And so here's a depiction, here's a movie of what the Gulf Stream is doing. And <clears throat> you, 
you can see that it's really variable. And I'm going to talk in just a moment about why it's so variable. But when you consider putting a turbine underwater, this is what we call the 100 meter isobath. So this kind of defines what's known as a shelf break. So in here it's pretty shallow, and out here it's extremely deep, meaning 200 meters, 4,000 meters. And what you notice about the Gulf Stream flow is it's consistently close to Cape Hatteras. So you have a lot of flow that tends to stick right here at the, at the shelf break. So if you went down here to Wilmington, you said, let me put a turbine offshore. You might see that the Gulf Stream's offshore half the time. And sometimes it's on your turbine, sometimes it's not. This is the average path over years and years of the, of the Gulf Stream. And again, you note that it's laid up right here on the shelf break off of Cape Hatteras, which made us say, hey, it might be a really good source of energy if you were to put an underwater turbine. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, so these are in degrees uh, C. So this is 5, 10, 50. Yes, temperature. I'm sorry. I should have told you that. So um, yeah, what you also note is you'll see this is going through, I think, a whole year. So here when we get into the summer, you can't really see the Gulf Stream down here because there's not a very large temperature gradient, right? There's not a big difference between the temperature of the Gulf Stream water and the temperature on shore here. And then as we get into the winter months, you'll note that that gradient kind of moves down here and you can really see the Gulf Stream flow. But do you measure the current in the summer to make sure where? Yeah, well, I'm going to get to some of that. Okay. That's yeah, a really special question. I keep that question in mind here because I want to talk a little more about that. Um, So this is all surface, this, sorry, I should go, this is sea surface temperatures. So in the summertime, the sun heats up the surface of the water. And in this area, this cool water is always there, but you'll see in the surface, it gets warm and you, you know, you're only looking at the top here. Um, and so here's a, a few transects that we are exploring, trying to understand what the available energy from the Gulf stream would be along each of these three transects off of North Carolina. And our main focus here at CSI is on this transect here. And I'm going to speak more about that and what we're doing to try to measure the Gulf Stream currents there. And so this is my terrible artistic work, but uh, why, why here? Why are we interested in the Gulf Stream along that transect I showed you? And <clears throat> what we have here is the coastline of Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina. And this is the underwater topography. So the reason that the Gulf Stream, one of the largest reasons that the Gulf Stream does what it does and goes where it goes is called topographic steering, which is a, a fancy way of saying the Gulf Stream likes to fo follow these bottom contours. And a really important thing, so this is the Blake Plateau. This is not what we would call the abyss. Out here is the abyss. You can see it drops off really steeply. And this, this depth out here is like 4,700 meters. And here we're like four to 600 meters. Right here is, is a feature in the bottom called the Charleston Bump. And so this, this rise right here is about 200 meters. And the Gulf Stream feels that rise as it comes out of the Florida Straits. It bumps against the Charleston Bump. And it starts this meander downstream. And that wave decays as, as it approaches Cape Hatteras. And that's key because if you want to put a turbine in, you don't want the, the Gulf Stream going offshore, coming back onshore. And the variability off of Cape Hatteras is minimal. So that's why we're in this little box looking at those different transects in terms of Gulf Stream energy. Now, why does it m decay down here? And I like to use this analogy of a ballerina. So if you imagine the Gulf Stream as these columns of water, that have some spin to them. And again, we have a fancy word for spin, and we call it vorticity in oceanography. In mathematics, we talk about the curl of something. But the Gulf Stream, as it moves through here, is like a bunch of columns of water with some spin to them. And when a water column's spinning and its nearest buddies, its neighbors next to it, are spinning the same way, it's, it's nice and happy. That's kind of a a low energy situation where you don't have a lot of friction moving back and forth. And so it tends to want to preserve that spin as all these columns move from the Florida Straits up here. Now when they get off of Cape Hatteras, 
there's a very steep drop off. And so if you imagine a column of water like an ice skater spinning, if it comes up that drop off onto the shelf here where it's very shallow, it has to squash way down, spread way out, and slow up. And that's just not going to happen when all of its neighbors right next to it are spinning. They're tall and thin and spinning at a fast rate. And so what that tends to do is constrain the variability of the Gulf Stream in this area because it's so steep the Gulf Stream doesn't tend to wander very much here because it doesn't want to squash and stretch. All right, so is it a potential source of renewable energy for North Carolina? That's what we'd like to know. And so this figure shows, here's North Carolina, here's Cape Hatteras, and here are those three cross-shelf transects. And now the color instead of temperature is um, water speed or velocity in meters per second. And you can see these hot colors right here are where we have the greatest energy resource, where you have a lot of water moving. And this is the area that we're focused on at the Coastal Studies Institute, because this area, you'll notice, doesn't meander back and forth off the shelf break nearly as much as these two other transects. So a potential turbine site might be here. And so there are all kinds of considerations when you talk about turbines. Ellie, do you have a question? Oh, <laughs> these little dots are showing you the surface currents. So they're the arrows showing you the direction of the current. So it's moving this way. And again, we focused on this cross-shelf line right here. And we're interested in seeing if you put a turbine in shallow water here, um, right in like 225 meters of water depth, if you would get enough of a resource. And why are we interested in that shallow water? Because as we go offshore, it gets deeper. The cable runs get further to your tur turbine. The challenges, the engineering challenges of putting some kind of mooring in here are greater. And so basically the expense goes up. So, yes? You use the term uh, meandering. Is, is there any sort of cyclic meandering? Is there something relative to seasonal meandering or uh, over decades or whatever? How stable is the Gulf Stream, basically? All of the above. So high frequency meanders that we typically see off of Cape Hatteras are three. Not right now. So, um, you know, we see high frequency meanders on the order of three to seven days off of Cape Hatteras. There are seasonal meanders, there are seasonal changes in transport. Um, there are decadal changes with other long-term oscillations that go on with the ocean, like, um, like you, you're probably familiar with El Nino. There's a North Atlantic oscillation that is 10-year oscillation as well. And so that stuff is all, and, and how all that works together, we don't quite understand yet whether those things are predictable. So this is, we put an instrument here that I'm going to talk more about and measure the currents for nine months. And there's a lot of variability, but you can kind of see like a, a longer term kind of variability here. Like you were asking, what kind, what kind of variability in time do you see? What, this, is <coughs> this is the acoustic, this is the instrument that I'll speak more about. It's measuring the current at a 75 meter water depth. And this is what the current is. This is meters per second, and this is time, nine months over nine months. And we also have a model running there, so we'd like to see how well did the model perform at the same location. And so the instrument is measuring currents, and that's red, and the model is blue, and it tends to capture a lot of the variability. And on average, the model captured the same average current speed at that location over that nine months, which, which we thought was pretty good. If you're looking at how much energy you have, the model was, was pretty reliable. It doesn't capture all the variability. Yes? Uh, the 75 meter depth, did, was that chosen because that was the optimum, uh, I mean, the best depth for putting uh, equipment down there or it was the best depth current. So we've looked at all the depths at that location, but we have chosen to highlight the 75 meter depth because that's about what the turbine axis location would be, so that it was low enough underneath the surface of the water to not be affected by waves and ship traffic, but still in enough of the resource to get current speeds. And it could be done, engineered. engineered. I'm an oceanographer, 
So <laughs> I'll tell you what's there to go get, yeah. Um, this is just f looking at the comparison between the power on average and the model. So this is power density in watts per meter squared and how well both perform. And there is a slight difference because the model varies a bit. And basically this goes by the speed cubed. So if you have a small difference in the model compared to the, the measurements of the current, it gets, uh, it, <coughs> it gets larger as you cube the difference in speed. Um, this is what the model says the variability at that location is from year to year. So we don't have five years of measured currents, but the model can look at five years. And you can see that there is still an enormous amount of variability in the average power that's available over a five-year time period at that location, according to the model. This is looking at a location at the, at the same depth, but much further to the south. And you see that the, the resource is much lower. So why is this 2010 such an anomaly? That's because, um, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. So <clears throat> it's not because the Gulf Stream is flowing much more. The oh, sorry. The question was, why is 2010 in the upper left panel here such an anomaly compared to the other years? And that's a great question. Um, the reason is not because the Gulf Stream is flowing and ebbing and flowing and ebbing, but more because the Gulf Stream spent a good bit of time offshore of this location in 2010. So if you have a turbine there and the Gulf Stream's over there, that's what happens. Is there any reason for that? that I mean, it's in science that we looked at that in 2010, and we don't know exactly why it spent so much. There was a really interesting dog leg in the Gulf Stream path in 2010 that went whoosh, way offshore and came whoosh, right back on, and it stayed out there for about two months. Of we don't have um, good, good measurements like that yet. Yeah. So the question is, um, how will the sea level rise affect the Gulf Stream transport? And so I don't know the answer to that, but there are some hypotheses that there's some kind of a tipping point to this ocean circulation. And one that I've heard, and I don't honestly know that much about, is that that, that overturning of heat, if you freshen the waters to the north, in the North Atlantic, where that water is subducted, so that it's not as dense as it used to be because salty water is denser than fresh water and it stops sinking as fast that you basically slow that whole process in the whole North Atlantic. Um, there's a heck of a lot of an uncertainty in making a statement like that. So, um, so these were some different transects that we looked at <coughs> at different depths and different power available, availability and you can see the comparisons to the power density in the wind field off of North Carolina. And I, uh, I stole this slide from my student because I really love the animation, but I'm going to go a little bit faster through this because it's from a different presentation and I don't want to get bogged down in too many of the details. I want to have time for the fun part here. So how do we find out? Um, so our group is making three different types of observations off of North Carolina focused on that area that I showed you and I'll, I'll repeat again. We use um, an acoustic, I'm sorry, we use an, a bottom mounted acoustic Doppler current profiler that we, we put in 225 meters of water and measure the currents for the whole entire water column for up to a year. So the strength of that measurement is we get a really nice long-term look at one place, but it's only one place. Um, then we use surface currents from coastal ocean radars that we have on the coast to look at what the Gulf Stream's doing, and the key to those surface currents is trying to determine where the Gulf Stream is hourly by looking at the surface currents. And the strength in doing that is that we get consistent looks at where the Gulf Stream is for years and years hourly, which you cannot really do with sea surface temperatures. Um, somebody asked about how do you look at the variability in position, especially when the temperature gradient in the summertime doesn't show you where the Gulf Stream edge is located, as we saw in that video. And so we use radars to look at that. And then finally, we make small boat acoustic Doppler current profiler transects to basically look down into the water column and drive across the Gulf Stream and look at 
how the current varies with a different position, but it's only a snapshot in time. So I'm going to go into detail on all of these things. Um, the first thing is we have a bottom mounted acoustic Doppler current profiler, and this is a little cartoon just kind of give you an idea of what it does. It sits on the bottom, it looks like a fancy fish finder, and I'll show you some pictures of it shortly. And it measures what the currents are doing over the whole entire water column for like a year. And it's located right here at this little red cross. And I have integrated all three of these observations so you can see how they're all interrelated. Um, here's where we'll put this instrument on the bottom. In fact, we just put one there yesterday. This little cross shelf transect is where I drive a boat so that I can start here, go into the Gulf Stream and come back and see how the current varies as I go deeper and deeper um, into the stream. And then these are the surface currents that we get from the radars that are located here in Duck, Cape Hatteras, and in the core banks. And so again, here we're focusing on the transect. This is where I'd start the transect here. This is Cape Hatteras. It's about 100 meters deep here. It's 1,000 meters deep here. And right in between, we have this bottom mounted instrument that measures the current. So that way I can compare the currents that I measure with the boat to the currents that I'm making measurements of from the bottom up. And that was the first deployed in 2013. We recovered the second deployment yesterday and deployed yet another one. So we have a nice long-term record beginning in J July 26, 2013 at that same location we've been measuring the currents over the entire water column since then. Yeah, so um, for this instrument, they're stored in the instrument and we have to get the instrument back to get them. So in fact, in the garage right now, I'm downloading a year's worth of current measurements because it takes that long to get them off of the instrument. So we're really happy when the instrument comes back to us and we have lots of challenges that come <laughs> along with doing that. So here's an example of that one that was deployed in 2013. This is what it looks like. The instrument is sitting inside this pod. That orange part pops off and comes to the surface with a line that's attached to this bottom part. And so that's how we get the things back. This rig up here is an acoustic release. So we'll pay out a thousand meters a line. And then when we think it's near the bottom, we fire that release and it drops that thing on the bottom. None so far, but we've had some very close calls. So this one we got from the manufacturer when we popped it to come back. It, it's, it had 500 meters of line in it that they flaked out inside the pod. And it released about 60 meters and it hung itself. And we could see it in the water column because we, we have a little acoustic device to range it. And we knew that it had come out and gotten hung. And it stayed like that for about a month until I could get a recovery mission together. And we took a grapple and we dragged around there until we cut the line and got that orange part back, which has all the toys in it. So we lost the anchor, which isn't cheap, but it's relatively cheap. And it has none of the information on it, so that's nice. Um, and this is the kind of record that we get from an instrument like that. So what this is, is this is the bottom. And this is coming height above the bottom. And again, we're at a water depth of exactly 228 meters. This is the bottom. This is 200 meters above the bottom. Nine months of time, and I'm looking at what the currents are. And it's color-coded from negative 3 meters per second to 3 meters per second. And this is a long stream, so it's oriented like down current. So there are times when there's virtually no current. There are times when the current reverses, and there are times when the current approaches three meters per second. Stephen? Ah, that's a good question. So, again, this is oriented a long stream. So, if the current's flowing in the direction of the Gulf Stream at three meters per second, it's red. If the current reverses and goes this way, it's negative three meters per second, and it's blue. So again, we, the next kind of observations that we make are surface currents from coastal ocean radars. And what we did as part of our project is we put 
an added coastal ocean radar down here in the core banks. And it's right at this uh, little fishing camp down here. This is a map of the core banks. Here's Cape Lookout. That radar's here and it operates in real time and gives us current measurements. And from one radar, it's just the relative velocity of the current to the radar. So this is color coded, not so important. But when we get a bunch of radars, we have one here, one here in Cape Hatteras, one at Duck, there's one up in Virginia Beach, there's one up at Cedar Island. This is the kind of current coverage that we had before we put that radar in. And this is the current coverage that we have now that we put a radar in here. So we basically got down into this area where we're really interested in looking at what the available resource is for North Carolina. And you can see it's pretty apparent where the Gulf Stream is located by the surface currents, which provides us an advantage over historical techniques using sea surface temperatures to figure out where the Gulf Stream is. You might get one satellite pass per day. If it's cloudy, you get nothing. We get something like this every hour. <clears throat> and then finally, we do small boat acoustic Doppler current profiler transects. So here is an, the instrument itself. This is an ADCP that we have on our boat out in the garage right here. Here's me standing after a long day of getting my butt handed to me in the Gulf Stream. And we basically swing this arm down so the instrument, like a fish finder, looks down in the water column. And we can measure <laughs> what the current's doing. And again, along that transect, we start at about 100 meters. Cape Hatteras is right here. And we drive the boat out to about 1,000 meters. That bottom pod with the other instrument is right here. And you can see these current vectors. This is just one, one location in the water column as we drive across. And you can see as I get out here, the current starts to increase. This is basically the edge of the Gulf Stream. And then we go out here. And also, the instrument measures water temperature. So you can see. This is, this is done in, um, in, I think it's November. You can see the cool water here, and then when we get to that increase in current, we're getting into the warmer Gulf Stream waters. So I do this every time that I can, meaning whenever the weather's good enough for me to take a 28-foot boat 50 miles offshore. Uh, last year we did it three times, and I'd like to do it six times this year. Um, again, highlighting the location of the ADCP that's on the bottom when we do this. And here's a similar picture for the boat transects, but now we're looking at the surface and going down. That instrument only measures about 100 meters under the water, so this is the top 100 meters of the water column. And here we're going from the 100 meter isobath offshore. So this is zero kilometers, and I drive offshore about 14 kilometers. And you can clearly see the Gulf Stream signature in the current measurements from the boat. And so this is color coded. The hotter colors are faster currents, and the cooler colors are slower currents. And then for an oceanographer, I see something like this, really fast currents in the bottom. And that's really interesting, because there's another thing going on here where some, some water from the shelf is slipping down underneath the stream and going the other direction, which is pretty neat to see. All right, so how do we do this? How are we doing all this stuff? This is the fun part. This is, this is something I just put together on the, in the car on the way home for everybody. So what we do is we send CSI's finest offshore. So we just got back. We were on this converted trawler called the Tiki. And my right-hand man here, Trip, a.k.a. Rip Van Winkle, who is, never got seasick, but as long as you could wake him up, you had a good hand on deck. And then here's me, the goofball. And we went offshore. And we recovered one of those pods that I showed you us putting overboard. And what happened, it was extremely frustrating. This is the one that I had flaked the line out rather than the manufacturer. And we have an acoustic release that just has a latch on it. So we, go, we throw over a transducer, kind of like, like a fish finder. We send this thing a signal and we say, hey, are you there? Are you upright? How far away are you? We zero in on where it is, and then we say, OK, come back. And we shoot a signal down there, and a latch fires. And that flotation piece is supposed to pop up and pay out all this line to the surface. So we stood there after we fired the release for about three minutes. And I had my wetsuit on and my flippers and things. And the current is just ripping. And then, boom, somebody said, there it is. And it's 100 yards from the ship, right? Let's get the ship over there before the current pulls it down. And we turn the ship around, we start heading that way, and I get ready to jump overboard with a line to put on it. 
and we watch this thing go and go underwater, gone, before we could get to it. So <coughs> we drove around and saw it on the boat, fish finder, and saw that it had buried itself 200 feet underwater in minutes. So we had to grapple around until we cut that line again, and then when we did, it floated back up and, and we got it back. So this has all the instruments in it and all the current measurements that I showed you from that last one. And it's sitting out in the garage right now, sending me all those, that information. It takes like three hours to get. Um, let's see here. And this is us taking it home, loading it this afternoon. Um, and this is the next one that we're putting out. So this is a different design. This one doesn't have line anymore. We're tired of being hung up. This just has a plate on the bottom. And so what happens when we want to get this one back is we send the release code and everything comes up and leaves a piece of metal on the bottom that's about that thick and that big. Um, so hopefully that's the solution. Is it improved? I guess we'll see. And here's some footage of us working on it. First we have to get that acoustic release ready. And it's rigged in to the line here. This is unedited, so if there's expletives, hopefully only my kids will hear. hear them. And then here's where it's going overboard. Really, it shows up on the depth finder. All right, so here I'll give you a shot of the finder. You can see right in here there's a line going out. And I'll show you another picture of this. And then there it is rigged, and so now it's going overboard. That's the thing that drops it when it gets to the bottom. And then here's the pod itself going over. And this thing weighs about 900 to 1,000 pounds. What's it made of? Lots of different things. It has metal and plastic, and inside there's a, it's called syntactic foam. That's just a piece of plastic cover that goes on it. And that little clicker <laughs> is uh, the clicker on a fishing rod. So we had braided line on there attached to that. So when it d actually did hit the bottom, we could feel it. Because we don't want to keep paying out cable when it hits the bottom and take that acoustic release and send it right down on top of everything. So we need to feel it hit the bottom and cut it off. We didn't know we were going to see it as well as we did on, um, on the ship's depth sounder. Um, there is technology to do that. It's expensive and it's a bit fraught with bugs. So um, there is an acoustic modem made by the same company that makes that ADCP that will send the data, the, pr the ADCP will process the data somewhat so it's smaller instead of the raw data and it will send through an acoustic signal um, to another modem on the surface, the data, and then you ha if you have some buoy with all this stuff on it, then in a way to send it back from the buoy, you can send it via satellite modem or a cell phone if it's close enough or something like that. But uh, the more complicated you get, the more things break, and that's an expensive, expensive deal in 800 feet of water where we are. To, to actually, a buoy there would be extremely expensive. So we just wait. <laughs> But, but the radars are, you know, they're on the cable network, they're on land, and so like every hour you can see on the net, internet what the currents are doing. I've used them to go fishing with some success, so they're cool. Um, this is a picture of the, the bottom sounder for the boat. So this is, this is where we wanted to drop the pod. This is where the pod was that we recovered. It wasn't exactly where we wanted. So we, 
the Gulf Stream was screaming this way. So we'd drive the boat up here and start that process of hooking up the acoustic release and paying out all that cable. And as we're doing that, the boat's drifting, drifting, and we hope we get the drift right to the waypoint that we want. And then when we're here, we hope we're close to the bottom and we let it go. And here you can see the line paying out behind the boat actually on the, on the sounder. So the boat's right here, and this is the line with the instrument on it going all the way to the bottom. And this is the water depth in feet. And this is the defining moment of getting rid of it, rid it, rid, getting rid of the pod when it hits the bottom. So that's it. We just sent a signal for that thing to say, let it go, Psh, gone. And that's it. Um, and I have some acknowledgments. Trip, who is our technician, was on the boat, and he took a lot, all the pictures and video that I showed you at the end there. Uh, he made some figures, um, and I'd like to thank the crew of the Tiki and the NOAA's research vessel, the SRVX, that have been deploying and recovering these for us. The state of North Carolina for funding the Ocean Energy Program. Uh, Dr. Billy Edge is the director, and Nancy is our director here. Harvey Symes, a professor at UNC that I've been working with on some of this project, and of course, all the folks at CSI that have been very supportive of all of our work, Corey and John, Jonathan, and folks that are here tonight especially. Um, if, do you guys have any questions for me? So what's the future? Oh, oh yeah, sorry. John's telling me. I, it's your turn here. Would you be so kind? So what's the future? What's the future? Um, that's a good question. I'm afraid I don't have an answer to. I can tell you what we're doing to determine that. So I showed you the work that we were doing to measure the available currents, observation-based measurements. We're actively comparing them to a regional specific model so we can find out and validate the model to see if it works well when we're not making measurements to estimate the energy resource. There's an engineering group at NC State that are making these considerations for how would you put a mooring on the bottom there? What does the bottom look like? How would you design an anchor line and a turbine? Um, we have a group of economists at NC State and here at CSI that are trying to use all of this information and integrate it to say, this is what the levelized cost of energy would be from a turbine like that. And then we put that out there and we hope that it interests in more investment from the private community to play a part in this. So at this point, I would say we don't know what the future holds because we don't know what the resource is yet. Um, you could see in the model there's a lot of variability from year to year. We don't have enough observations to say that that's actually true. We think that it is because of the variability in position. Um, but it's still a bit of a question. Very exciting. Thank you. Caleb, hang on. I'm right on the microphone. I've got well, you got to have it for the, the you got a whole internet audience that's listening to you. Oops, excuse me. So how long does it take for the data to get downloaded from the ADCP? And then once you get it downloaded, how long does it take you to get everything compiled and see what's been happening over the last, you said it's been nine months that that's been down there? Yeah, that, that's about nine months worth. So. It actually takes about three hours to download the data from the ADCP card to the computer on a serial interface. Um, we tried twice on the way back because we were like salivating to see what happened. And, um, and it was so rough and everything had to be done outside that we had to bag it because we were afraid we were going to hose the computer sitting out there waiting. Um, but. Uh, it doesn't take us long to have a look at the currents from this and analyze the data from the instrument that's on the bottom because it's relatively simple uh, and it comes back in a really nice 
form. Uh, the boat's a different story because the boat's pitching and rolling and moving and you have to get all of that out of the current measurements and have confidence that you got it out right. And uh, that's really difficult. So uh, one of the major accomplishments we had this year was to do that and show uh, the boat data compared to the moored data, which is kind of like the gold standard. You believe that instrument that's sitting on the bottom. You don't know if you can believe what the boat's telling you and get those things to match up. And so that took a long time, like a year of working with the data. Um, the coastal ocean radar data I've been working with for 10 years. And there are all kinds of different tricky little things that have to be worked out to make sure that you have confidence in the data. Like if I showed you the currents that I put up here before, I could show, you know, I, uh, as seasoned eye, I could be like, that's true, that's nonsense, that's true. And so we're working really hard to get the nonsense out. And I'm, while someone's working on the data from a technical standpoint to make sure that it's the best it can be, like quality controlling it, simultaneously I work on the data to develop methods to say, there's the Gulf Stream. This is how it's varying. And so then we go back and forth, it's kind of a feedback thing. Oh, the mic. Thank you. My question is, uh, with the evidence of global warning, warming, how will this impact the Gulf Stream going forward? Well, <clears throat> I don't think we know the answer to that yet, but I think the monitoring that we're doing can, sh you know, over longer periods show us changes. But first you, first you have to establish a baseline. So you have to know what's out there now before you can say how it's changing over longer periods of time. Um, but there's a, you know, there's a significant amount of uncertainty in models that tell you what's going to happen in the next 10 years with ocean circulation. And I think at this point, we don't have an answer for that, to be honest with you. Anybody else? Oh, Ellie, you have another question. Here, you take the microphone, young lady. When it rains, does the Gulf Stream get higher? Um, the Gulf Stream is not really affected in height so much by the rain, but it's so much warmer than the water around it that if you looked across the ocean, if you could see this, you would see a hill where the Gulf Stream is because that water is warmer and it's expanded more. And so because of the way that is, there's a hill and then there's what we would kind of call a it's a bare clinic current, which means that you have a large difference in density of the Gulf Stream water and the cooler, denser water around it. Because you have this hill and this current that looks like this, um, you have a lot of potential energy there. Meaning, if you take water that's in a bucket and you slop the water up on the side, it won't sit there, right? Because gravity tries to bring it back down. Well, if you have a hill of water, it wants to do this. And if you have warm water sitting in all this cold water, it wants to do this. And there's constant forcing by the winds to make this current. And so as that changes just a little bit, some of that potential energy that's trapped there can translate into kinetic energy. So a little bit of that can change and give some energy into a meander or a change in the flow of the Gulf Stream. That was a long-winded answer to whether the rain <laughs> <clears throat> you may just kind of answer this a little bit with that explanation, but it seems if you look at the topography of the ocean and especially down through Florida, it's obvious why the current would hug the shore so tightly there, even down through Georgia and some of South Carolina. But then once you get up into North Carolina, you've got that really steep drop off at the continental shelf. Is that pretty much the only thing that temperature gradient is that the only thing keeping the Gulf Stream that pushed up that close against the shore? It seems like, or that uh, close against the coast, it seems like once it gets out in that deep water, it would actually fan out a little bit more. All right, there's a two-part answer to that. So the temperature gradient isn't what keeps the Gulf Stream up against the coast. Um, that is a complicated answer, and a big part of it has to do with 
a vorticity balance in the North Atlantic Ocean. So what does that mean? It means you're sp you have this circulation in the North Atlantic Ocean, some spin, right? And you're constantly putting in torque with the wind. If there wasn't anything to counter that torque that you put in, the water would spin faster and faster and faster and faster. So there has to be some counter force that's keeping it balanced the way it is. And part of that counter force, a big part of it, is that you have a frictional torque with this high velocity going past the shelf break. It creates a lot of friction drag on the stream going this way. And you have to have really high velocities to get really high torques back the other way, which is why you have, one reason why you have a western boundary current, a Gulf Stream that travels really fast and then on the other side, not so fast. And you asked about the constraint, I call it like topographic steering of the bottom on the Gulf Stream, and the bottom definitely affects the path of the Gulf Stream, and the Charleston bump makes it want to meander, and the steepness at Cape Hatteras that borders the inshore side keeps it from doing a lot of this, and once it leaves what's called the point to fishermen at Cape Hatteras, it, le it leaves the shelf break and it goes off into deep ocean water, which is 4,000 plus meters, okay? It doesn't have those topographic constraints anymore, and it does exactly what you're talking about. It starts this wild meandering, and um, it breaks into different fingers and comes back together, and yeah, so that's what happens. And so you wouldn't put a turbine out there, even though the volume flow off of like Maine of the Gulf Stream is 150 sphere drifts, so 60 more than off of Cape Hatteras, but if you, it just meanders wildly. In fact, so the best analogy to this, it was a famous oceanographer, Tom Rosby, I think, made, was the Gulf Stream is like a garden hose. And so if you turn up the pressure on a garden hose a lot, it'll tend to do this. But the flow is consistent, so if you, relatively consistent. So if you look at the Gulf Stream and what it does as you go underwater, you basically have that slope I showed you. That slope when the Gulf Stream moves is preserved. It, it moves like a garden hose. The flow through the hose is the same, but the position changes. Sorry, that's a long-winded answer for that. But. Uh, one other question. Then again, I may have another question. If you take the energy out of the Gulf Stream, what's the relative impact? That's a good question. So um, the only way that's been looked at, as far as I know, is that um, it, the question is, if you were to put a bunch of turbines, so you had this what's called form drag on the Gulf Stream to such an extent that you had so many turbines that it had to pass through, how, you know, how much drag would there have to be from that before the Gulf Stream just said, well, we're going around you. And so the only way we've been able to look at that is with models. And there are some models that show that you can introduce enough form drag with, if you were to basically take the entire Florida Straits where the Gulf Stream is constrained between the Bahamas and Florida and just all the way across, put turbines, you could put enough drag that the Gulf Stream might do something like go around. Or slow down? It probably won't slow down. It will go around because the forcing, it's, it's, like, it's kind of like a, uh, you have some, you have some, um, some conservation of mass, right? So you're, you have all this water coming down the other side and it's not going to heap into a pile. It's got to go somewhere, so it's going to go, and if you put something in front of it, it's going to go around it. Oh, hang on. Did you have the um, turbine at the end of Jeanette's Pier? Was we, that part of your research at all? Um, what we put at the end of Jeanette's pier was called a wave energy converter. So it was a flap and the waves would go by and the flap would drive the turbine flow. And that wasn't part of my research, but field wise it was part of our ocean energy program to test that device. So I was involved in 
figuring out how to put it in and get it back out again. How did that work? And would it be something in the future to put more of those, considering all the storms we end up having on the coast? It worked uh, um, really well, according to the company that made it. They were really pleased with the energy that they got out of it. Their business niche for that wave energy converter is not to be um, a large scale power source for a city, but to go somewhere like a third world country where they don't have clean water and let it power a desalination plant or something. And so that's their focus. So they, they actually have been to some of the more remote areas in Alaska. They've been putting them out there um, and testing them on the, on the West Coast. Um, whether they would be a large scale energy source, that's not what they're going for. You know, I don't know that couldn't do that some other way, but. Wow, I got a lot of interest. Thanks. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you.